Okay, so um, <clears throat> doing these readings uh, in Jordan Peterson and Renee Ganon and Camille Paglia has made me a bit nostalgic uh, about myth studies, which is the field that I came out of. That's where I started way back many years ago in the mid-90s. Uh, when I was hired uh, right out of college uh, with a degree in English, I was hired by the Joseph Campbell Foundation to help edit uh, Joseph Campbell's posthumous writings. Um, they were working with Harper Contract, and so I wrote footnotes for his travel diaries to India and Japan that he undertook in the 1950s and the mid-50s, and then uh, a couple of essay books and uh, so forth. Um, they lost their contract from HarperCollins, and that was that. But uh, it was my beginning, and what I figured I would do now is to go back and do a chapter-by-chapter -chapter analysis of Joseph Campbell's great uh, four-volume opus, his history of religious ideas, basically, which he called the Masks of God, and start with the first volume, which is Primitive Mythology, and uh, that was published in 1959, after he had just gotten back from his uh, trip to India in uh, 54, 55, and to Japan in 55, 56. Um, Campbell's first book, uh, his first great book, was The Hero with a Thousand Faces, of course, his most famous which was published in 1949. Uh, but he began uh, out of college. Uh, he graduated with a degree uh, in English specializing in Arthurian romances, uh, but he never went back for higher degrees after getting an MA in English. Um, and instead he spent, uh, he went on a trip to uh, Paris, visited Europe, and when he came back in the late 20s, uh, the depression had just hit um, and there weren't any jobs. So he couldn't get a job, so he decided just to spend the Next five years living in a cabin doing nothing but reading, 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 reading. And basically what he read during that period were, were the works of Oswald Spengler, uh, the German anthropologist Leo Frobenius, Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, Thomas Mann in his novels, the novels of James Joyce, um, and the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer, Immanuel Kant, and the works of Goethe. Uh, so he comes out of that background of the German romantic and idealist tradition. That's the background that he brings with him into this field of the study of comparative mythology. And then so um, long about uh, 1940, Heinrich Zimmer, the great Indologist, uh, he had come across, the Nazis had chased him out of the University of Heidelberg in 1938. And in 3940, he was teaching in England uh, for a while there, and then he moved to New York, uh, to New Rochelle in 1940 where he began giving lecture courses at Columbia University on Indian art, culture, and mythology, where Joseph Campbell met him in 1940. And so the two hit it off, and Zimmer became his mentor, uh, as he says, his last great mentor. Uh, Zimmer then died unexpectedly in 1943, uh, the same year that Campbell published his first book for uh, the Bollingen Press um, that was uh, called Where the Two Came to Their Father, which was a commentary on a Navajo myth about uh, the twins, uh, monster slayer and child born of water, who are reconciled to their father, the sun god, after going through a series of initiatory journeys and ordeals. And so it's basically a thin book that's just a commentary. He had been working for a while on his uh, skeleton key to Finnegan's Wake with Henry Morton Robinson, which they co-authored and put out the next year in 1944. And then in 1946, Campbell... Uh, had decided to, he had inherited uh, Zimmer's posthumous legacy and decided to edit it and put out all of his lectures at Columbia uh, with the first volume in 1946, Myths and Symbols in Indian Art and Civilization. Zimmer had begun his career, by the way, by writing in 1926, um, Kunstform and Yoga, uh, basically artistic form and yoga in the symbolism of India, which Carl Jung read and liked very much uh, and may have gotten the idea for the mandala from that book with its studies of the Sri Yantra. And so in 1946 then, uh, Campbell publishes the first of the Zimmer volumes, Myths and Symbols in Indian Art and Civilization, I think still the greatest introduction to Indian art and culture. Uh, and that was followed by, in 1948, he put out The King and the Corpse, which was a collection of various tales from around the world comparing uh, Celtic myths with uh, Indian myths, um, as well as some Arabian narratives and some Christian narratives and so forth some Arthurian romance narratives. Um, and that book, I think, in many ways, uh, was the main influence on Campbell's writing of The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is very similar to it in many ways. 
I have a audio lecture series on that book on YouTube, by the way. Uh, just type in John David Ebert on uh, Heinrich Zimmer's The King and the Court. I go through it uh, story by story. So he put that book out, and then in 1949, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Then in 1953, he published uh, Heinrich Zimmer's big uh, study of Indian philosophy, uh, Philosophies of India. And then uh, while he was in 1954-55, he went to India, uh, in, wrote uh, a series of journals, which I helped edit uh, in the late 90s, called Bakshish and Brahman. And while there, he put out the last of the Zimmer volumes, the great two-volume set, The Art of Indian Asia. That, that was it for him, for uh, Heinrich Zimmer. And while there in India, he was, he was rather disappointed about what he found in India because Heinrich Zimmer had never made the trip to India and had sort of romanticized it and I think painted a romantic impression in uh, Campbell's mind of India. And the, what he found there, the, the obsession with politics and the squalor and tawdriness uh, uh, rather disappointed him, I think. He even writes, there's a sentence in that diary, I remember him saying, I vow never to speak or write for India ever again. <laughs> of course, he didn't hold to that. But um, then he went to Japan, and he loved Japan. Uh, he thought the Japanese had their act together. Uh, everything was beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, and they, they just had their act together, whereas he didn't think the Hindus did. Um, so he came back, and in 1958, he started working on the masks of God, uh, which he says in the preface here to Primitive Mythology. He spent 12 years working on, from 58. Well, I guess he had started a couple of years earlier. 68 is Creative Mythology. That's the last volume, so it was a couple of years before that, 56, I suppose, he starts working on 12 years, basically a Jupiter cycle in astrology. That would be one complete cycle of the planet Jupiter around the sun, which takes 12 years. Um, so four volumes, Primitive Mythology, which nowadays if Primitive Mythology was put out, it would have to be called Aboriginal Mythology because Primitive has, it's not a politically correct term, it has connotations of dismissal um, and condescension to it that I, Campbell definitely did not have. Uh, but it would be misinterpreted that way. The second volume was uh, Oriental Mythology, uh, where he studies the mythologies of Asia, starting with uh, the Mesopotamian world and tracing it on across through India to uh, Japan. And then uh, in the third volume is Occidental Mythology, which studies all the mythologies of the West. And then finally, with uh, in 1968, I believe it is, with Creative Mythology, uh, he publishes the book that he calls basically uh, Northwestern Faust, what Spengler called Faustian civilization, the Scandinavian Celto-Germanic civilization, he called the civilization of creative mythology, in which all the myths for the first time come out of the, the secular literature and not so much out of institutions. So we call it creative mythology. In the West, we've done creative mythology. That, that's been our, our thing. Uh, so moving right into it, then, what I want to do is go through this uh, chapter by chapter. And I think that... Uh, He's got a quote in here in the beginning from Thomas Mann's novel, Joseph and His Brothers, where Mann says, uh, starts off by saying, very deep is the well of the past. Indeed, should we not call it bottomless? And Campbell takes that as his motto here for the book. And the book is oriented in such a way that it gradually moves backward in time, starting with uh, what he calls the mythologies of the great planters, uh, the mythologies of the primitive planters. This is the agrarian world, of course, that originated during the Neolithic. He starts with that world and then goes backward down into the world of shamanism and the Paleolithic and the caves and all of that, and then backward beyond that into the now very much outdated archaeology associated with the hominization process of the various stages of Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and Neanderthal and so forth. He goes through all of that. Um, the very he takes later on when he re, he planned to rework this whole thing uh, in his last years. Uh, with the historical atlas of world mythology. It ended up only being something like five volumes long, and he never got uh, beyond what the whole thing, as it stands, uh, is structurally equivalent to primitive mythology. Uh, and there he takes the, he, there he starts with the archaeology of the hominization process and goes strictly chronologically through uh, the caves, the Paleolithic, and then on into the Neolithic. But basically it ends up being one of the most detailed books ever written about Native American mythology. He starts with all of that and moves through the Native American uh, myths, which brought him full circle because as a kid, uh, the thing that sparked his fascination as a child was the Native American myths. And he said he always sided with the Indians, not the cowboys. And that was just, that's where it began for him. That's basically where it ended full circle when he died in 1987. 
And uh, so looking at this then, um, he starts off by saying that he wants to uh, establish, the prologue is called Toward a Natural History of the Gods and Heroes, uh, subsection one, the lineaments of a new science. And so what he wants to propose for the first time is the foundation of comparative mythology as a new science, as what he calls a natural history of the gods. Uh, and he says, this has never been done before. And indeed, this is the first book to go through and systematically show the evolution of human religiosity, uh, taking in all the scholarship from archaeology, anthropology, psychology, literature, and, and philosophy, and all of that, and sort of drawing from all of these disparate fields in one grand synthesis, one encyclopedic synthesis. He was the first on the mark here to do this. Eliade, Mircea Eliade did it later with his three-volume uh, unfinished history of religious ideas, but he did it in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, Campbell was way before him in that. Uh, by the way, um, Eliad uh, is fashionable to quote amongst academics. Uh, if you're an academic, it's okay if you cite Eliade. Uh, if you cite Campbell, you are shamed by other academics. Academics have the shaming culture. Uh, if you quote cite Campbell, you're shamed and, and regarded as somehow inferior. Uh, they don't like him. He didn't play their game. He didn't go back and get a PhD. He taught at Sarah Lawrence College, a private, uh, at that time, women's college, uh, and taught, taught there for the rest of his career. Uh, so he managed to escape academe and have a career as a public intellectual anyway, which is a process that, of course, has gotten more and more difficult over time for any American public intellectuals to make it outside of academe now is virtually impossible. Lewis Mumford had done it without a PhD, and so did uh, Jane Jacobs and uh, quite a few others. Uh, they don't seem to do that anymore. Um, so he says he wants to establish a science of mythology. And he says, if we look back, and what he does in this opening chapter is he goes through uh, and does a history of the landmarks that led up to and made possible the possibility of a science of mythology. Um, and it starts, he said, we, it could have started way back when there were recognitions that with the Bible and the classics, uh, Greek mythology, there are lots of similarities. Uh, there are virgin births uh, in both the Bible and in Greek mythology, for example, the comparison of Leda and the swan, Zeus taking the form of the great bird and impregnating Leda, very similar there, another example of a virgin birth. Or the flood myth, Deucalion and the flood, and the comparison there with Noah. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, of course, and that I think that puzzled people for, for a long, long time. But Greek myth was regarded simply as literature, whereas the Bible was regarded as literally true. All of this stuff really objectively happened, uh, whereas the Greeks just somehow they guessed at all of this through their literature. Um, so there was that, but then he says what happened was with the field of the development of Indo-European philology, which started taking off at the end of the 18th century, 1767 with Sir William Jones uh, in India, um, and then people like uh, Franz Bopp and individuals like that, in which it was recognized that uh, there were recognitions that Sanskrit essentially was very similar to Latin, and that there was obviously a cultural con continuity between uh, all the way from Ireland and Germany going all the way across to India. Uh, the gods are very similar, and the structure of the society is very similar, as later the French scholar Georges Dumézieux uh, would make a career as a sort of Indo-Aryan specialist structuralist about the tripartite structure of the Indo-Aryan, basic Indo-Aryan society. You could make structural comparisons between Vedic uh, India, let's say, and Attic Iceland, or with the Greeks in between. You could uh, say that Indra was essentially equivalent to Thor, both thunder-hurling deities, or Zeus, all three of them as uh, sovereign thunder hurlers, and so forth. You can find lots of equivalencies. The Ashvins, uh, the pair of, of twins in uh, Hindu myth being similar to the Gemini, and uh, so forth and so on. So there were all these, it was obvious that uh, there were all these equations and similarities, but it was wrongly thought, the conclusion that was drawn from this was that the Indo-Aryans somehow were the, the true founders of civilization. And so this began to get a little bit dangerous when these ideas started to migrate into politics. Uh, and um, through the 18th century, and you got books like Houston Stewart Chamberlain's Foundations of the 19th Century, down to Alfred Rosenberg's 1930 publication of his work, uh, with the idea that the Indo-Aryans 
it's a mistaken idea that the Indo-Aryans were the founders of civilization before the Semites. They were there before the Semites and created these all these civilizations. But in fact, what happened, of course, was that the archaeology had not come in yet to fully establish, or it was trickling in, to fully establish that the first generation of civilization was composed of the Mesopotamians, first the Sumerians, later the Babylonians. On the one hand, Egypt on the other, with the two satellite civilizations of Minoan Crete and uh, Harappan India, none of which were Indo-Aryan or Semitic. Uh, although there was a Semitic, the earliest Semites do start coming in in Sumer, the Akkadians were Semitic, and they may have been co-present there from the beginning along with the Sumerians, who were neither Semites nor Indo-Aryans, uh, but the Akkadians were. And of course, under Sargon of Akkad 2350 BC, uh, the Akkadians did indeed establish the first Semitic the, actually the world's first universal state when Sargon of Akkad conquered the entire uh, world from the lower ocean of the Persian Gulf to the upper ocean in the Eastern Mediterranean all the way to Cyprus and bound it together into a single empire. The Akkadians had very different style forms. Uh, they had an emphasis on beards. All their rulers had long, shaggy beards, very Semitic in that respect, whereas the Sumerians were bald, the priests were bald and clean-shaven. Lots of cultural differences between the two there. But um, now the Indo-Aryans, of course, even though they didn't take part in the founding of this first generation of civilization, which emerges 3500 BC out of the Middle East, 3000 BC roughly in Egypt, 2500 BC in Minoan Crete and in Harappa, they're simultaneous. The Indo-Aryans were around, of course, in the north, uh, had been around since about 5000 BC, as far as we know, uh, and seem to have originated in Europe, somewhere north of the, the Caucasus, uh, or the Black Sea, uh, near the Dnieper River, along the Don, the Volga. They come out of that region, and uh, we've got horse burials from those regions at the cemetery of Seji, for instance. We find horse burials with warriors, with implements buried in their graves going way, way back. So the Indurians were there as nomads, going back and forth across the steppe lands for a long time, about 3,000 years. Uh, after the first generation of civilization has come along, and they don't come along till the second generation, which they more or less inaugurate or co-inaugurate with the Semites coming up from the south out of the Syro arabian deserts and the Endurans coming down from the north in the three culture zones of, uh, or four rather, of India, Persia, and then in the west with uh, Greece and uh, the Germanic, Kelto, Scandinavian north. And then we've got uh, nomads, Mongolian nomads going in, founding uh, Chinese civilization, all at about the same time, all coming in around 1500 BC to 1000 BC and representing generation two of civilization, which of course wasn't founded by, uh, civilization itself wasn't founded by Indo-Aryans, but it, it was a later development. But uh, this was not known until the archaeology slowly trickled in. Campbell gives a, a, a timeline here near the end of the chapter where he says, uh, where he looks at all the key dates that led to all of this and that made a science of mythology possible. We've got Napoleon going into Egypt and then in 1821, uh, Jean-Francois Champollion uh, finding the Rosetta Stone and finally uh, enabling a correct translations of Egyptian texts. And it turns out that the Egyptian texts are the oldest uh, literary uh, religious texts in the world. They go back to 2600 BC. They're very old. The pyramid texts are, are the earliest. Um, of course, writing had already been invented by the Sumerians at Uruk in 3500 BC, but they were using it for administrative and bureaucratic purposes. They weren't writing myths down until much later, actually until about 2600 BC. That's when the first myths start to be written down in Sumer, about the same time as the Egyptians are writing down or committing the pyramid texts in the pyramid of Unas during the fifth dynasty. Uh, and they're doing that. Uh, it's clear that the pyramid texts are way, way older than that, though, because they're only writing them down because the priests aren't practicing the rites anymore. They're not going back in and remembering the spells. So they commit them to the walls to make sure that Pharaoh's cult uh, is eternally reverenced in connection with these magical spells. Then we've got, let's see here, um, William Ellis's Polynesian Researches in 1833. Polynesian mythology is, starts to come in. In 1839, we've got Henry Rose Schoolcraft with his Algic Researches, which is the first uh, collection of North American Indian myths. So those start coming in. In 1845-1850, Sir Austin Henry Laird basically invents archaeology. He's the first to go and excavate Nineveh. 
uh, and start bringing up treasures of the Mesopotamian civilization. And then between 1847 and 65, a Frenchman named Jacques Boucher de Crivecourt de Pert was the first to start looking at stone tools and to begin to realize that there was a much older, an old stone age uh, that was older than the European ancient medieval modern scheme, which he divided into three epochs as uh, the cave bear age, which would have been the age of Neanderthal man, the mammoth and woolly rhinoceros, woolly rhinoceros age, and the reindeer age. But then almost immediately after that, 1856, Johann Karl Fulrod discovers the bones of the first Neanderthal man, um, the great hunter of the cave bear, of course. 1859, we have Darwin's Origin of Species. And then uh, in 1861, the Pupil Vu is translated for the first time. And the Pupil Vu uh, is almost the only great surviving Mayan myth cycle. It's a great myth text. It's actually very similar to Campbell's uh, commentary on where the two came to their father, the Navajo myth about the two, uh, twin brothers. The Popol Vuh is also about twin brothers who undergo a series of, of uh, initiatory ordeals and journeys. Most Native American myths do feature this motif of the twins. It's the primary Native American myth archetype. Uh, and then we get this fellow, this German scholar, along about 1868, Adolf Bastian, who is the first to propose there's a problem there. there is all this knowledge is coming in. It's clear that there are mythic patterns that appear to be universal, like the virgin birth, the flood, uh, the idea of a golden age. Um, all, they're all over the planet. So the problem becomes then how to account for their similarities. How, how is this the case? And it's generally thought up to this point that there's parallel development. Certain, uh, the psyche uh, is roughly the same everywhere. It's the same biology and you've got the same influences acting upon uh, different peoples under different climates, maybe, but somehow they're just producing these myths spontaneously, which accounts for the similarities. Bastian was the, fir the first to propose this idea of a distinction between elementary ideas on the one hand and ethnic ideas on the other. The elementary ideas become uh, Carl Jung's archetypes of the collective unconscious. These are universal myth motifs, whereas the ethnic ideas are their local inflections which tend to have different connotations, uh, different aspects of these universal archetypes will be emphasized uh, to the detriment of others. Uh, so he's the first to propose this. Then we've got Edward Tyler in 1871, pointing out his book on primitive culture. Then in 1872, Schliemann's off and running uh, to <clears throat> further develop archeology. span He's the first to excavate Troy. He knew it was there. Uh, he went and dug up Troy, found it, uh, went and also dug up the, the Mycenaeans. Um, so he puts archaeology on the map, and it's starting to be realized that there is something more to Greek myths than just uh, literary fantasies. There was a, a certain reality to them. In 1879, he's got uh, here Don Marcelino de Sotola discovering on his property in northern Spain at Altamira the first cave art. So that's being found out now. And then uh, by 1890, we get, of course, Sir James George Frazier's 12-volume magnum opus, The Golden Bough, which is the first to start synthesizing all of this anthropological and archaeological knowledge that's coming in now. And then uh, in 1893, of course, Sir Arthur Evans goes to excavate Crete, and dig, he digs that up. And then in 1898, he ends this chronology here by saying we have the uh, obscure, now obscure German anthropologist Leo Frobenius, who announced his theory of the Kultur Kreislera, the culture circle uh, uh, theory, which is an important alternative to the idea of myths being produced spontaneously out of the human psyche and accounting for their differences simply by the structure of the human psyche being roughly the same everywhere. Whereas with Frobenius, he identified huge, what he called culture circles, where there are constellations of myths, motifs, artworks, uh, ornamentation and design, that clearly have been diffused, that have been taken through migratory processes from one geographical location through migrating populations to another. He identified a huge culture zone that he said extended from West Africa, going across equatorial Africa, across India, Indonesia, the Polynesian islands, and on into the New World, ending at the Northwest uh, Pacific co uh, coast there. It's in that zone, for example, that you find totem poles. So you find totem poles in Africa, just as you find them in China and you find them on the Northwest Pacific Coast. 
uh, looks like they've gotten there through a process of diffusion. And this diffusionary idea becomes sort of Campbell's specialty under the influence of Frobenius here. Uh, as a Jungian, he remains a Jungian to the end, uh, but a you know, little bit of a heretical Jungian in the sense that um, he leaves open room for the possibility that many of what appear to be archetypes of the collective unconscious are not archetypal and universal and biological, but are have been transmitted through diffusion. So he always leaves room for that. In his paper, The Symbol Without Meaning, he'll go through uh, into it and attack Jung's idea that the mandala is innate to the psyche and say, well, if it's innate to the psyche, why isn't it in the Paleolithic art? There are no mandalas in that art. And in fact, mandalas don't start appearing until the pottery of the Samarans and the Halafians long about 6500 BC in Mesopotamia. That's where the first true mandalas start appearing. So apparently, apparently that archetype isn't a structure of human biology, but it's a, it's a historical a historically determined form that came into being here. So every now and then Campbell will question a Jungian archetype and say, no, it, it looks like there may be a historical reason for why this or that archetype came into being. And so, of course, to round all this off, we get Freud's interpretation of dreams in 1900, and followed by his agonistic relationship with Jung, and then Jung produces in uh, 1912 his first great book on mythology, Von Lungen und Symbala der Libido, Symbols and Transformations of the Libido, uh, Freud follows it the next year in 1913 with Totem et Taboo. These are the two books that ended their relationship. They were completely in competition by this point. Um, their relationship was coming to an end, and those books ended their relationship. But it brought into being this idea of the unconscious, as for Freud being something that is biographically determined. Everything for Freud that's in the unconscious was once a conscious traumatic experience that got interjected and repressed. So everything that's in there can be brought up. But for Jung, uh, Jung has a biologically grounded theory of the unconscious. Uh, he would find motifs in dreams, myth motifs, that were never conscious in the first place and seem to have emerged spontaneously from out of what he called the collective unconscious as archetypes that are like engrams that are just sort of sitting in their light, analogous to instincts uh, that the psyche can spontaneously produce and which he thought could be used to explain the worldwide prevalence of the similarities in myths. So we'll leave it there uh, at the end of this uh, first chapter in Campbell's uh, Primitive Mythology.